speaker is Professor Sebastian Buxon from Ecole Polytechnique, and he's going to speak about recent progress in the yacht and Thompson conjecture. Okay, so thanks a lot for the, the virtual invitation, uh, which is a nice invitation anyway. Okay, so the, the goal of this talk is to report on some more or less recent, some of it quite recent progress on the Yao Tian and Natsun conjecture in the general setting of uh, constant scalar curvature uh, metrics as opposed to the more restricted one of Keller Einstein metrics, which is by now quite well understood. Uh, okay, so, oops. All right, so I will, I will start by recalling uh, some of the objects involved. So the main character in the talk is the k-energy functional. So first of all, the framework. So we work, we work on the smooth projective complex variety X, and L is a fixed ample line bundle on X. And we set N for the dimension of X, <clears throat> V for the volume of L. And we will assume for simplicity that the automorphism of the polarized variety XL is trivial. So there is only the trivial scaling action of C star on the fibers. So this is, of course, I mean, that's something that could be discussed, but for simplicity, we make this assumption. I will try to point out where, where this is used. Uh, so first of all, if you start from a keloform, keloform omega in the given cohomology class, the first chunk class of L, uh, then, viewed as a Keller metric, it has a Ricci curvature and then a scalar curvature, which is a function that you get by contracting the Ricci curvature. And this function, S of omega, the scalar curvature, <clears throat> uh, has a mean value, which is known in advance somehow, that can be expressed as a, as a simple intersection number, S bar, uh, as written here. So that, that's basically the subdominant term in the riemann rohr expansion in the riemann rohr theorem for the dimension of the space of sections of L, I mean, in particular. Uh, okay, so we are interested in, in a Keller form in the given class such that the curvature, the scalar curvature S of omega is constant and therefore equal to S bar. And to do this, we, we use the miracle of Keller geometry that you can parametrize Keller metrics by functions, which are known as Keller potentials. So you fix a Hermitian metric on L uh, such that the curvature is positive. It's a positive one, one form, therefore a Keller form omega in the first chunk class of L. And then every other Keller form by the DD bar lemma will be of the form omega plus IDD bar phi or omega plus DDC phi, which uh, is written in short as omega phi. And the set of such functions is the space uh, script H of Keller potentials. And now, uh, and now the, <clears throat> okay, the, the CSCK, oops, the CSCK equation, so the, the equation for a constant scalar curvature Keller metric, S of omega phi equals to S bar, uh, can be written as the Euler-Lagrange equation of a certain functional. That's a very important information about this uh, PDE on phi. So there is a functional which is known as the K-energy functional, but it's due to Mabuchi, so I use M as a letter. And this functional M has the, the property that its derivative at a point phi is basically equal to S bar minus S of omega phi. So it vanishes exactly when omega phi is a CSCK metric. And so what we look for are critical points of the functional M. Okay, so now to tell you a bit more about the, the functional M, we introduced another energy functional and then entropy. So first of all, one key character in this whole uh, story of say pluripotential or vari variational approach to the CSCK equation is Oops. the mont energy, E, which uh, again can be seen as a functional whose derivative at phi is equal to the mont measure, or MA of phi, which is, just the, <clears throat> which is just the volume form omega phi to the n normalized to volume one. 
So when I say derivative or anti-derivative, I just mean that you compute directional derivatives of E along, say, a path phi t, and then what you get is the integration of phi t dot against the mont pair of phi t. Uh, okay, and so the, this energy functional admits, of course, an explicit expression that you get by integrating uh, along segments in the space H, and what you get is a formula that is a positive linear combination of integrals of the form, the integral of phi against omega phi to some power, and then omega to some n minus j, the rest of it. Uh, and these kind of integrals are called mixed mont pair integrals, and they will show up several times in the talk. <clears throat> so we have this simple expression, which is amenable, which is manageable uh, in the setting of pluripotential theory. And the K-energy admits a decomposition into two parts, and both of which are expressed by things that involve the mont pair operator somehow. So the first part, part H of phi, is the entropy of the mont pair measure with respect to, to the reference measure omega to the n. So the expression is the, the inter, it would be the integral of f log f, where f is the density of the mont pair measure uh, ma of phi. That's a non-negative number. And then the remaining part, mpp of phi, is the pluripotential part of the k energy in that it also admits uh, a, an expression as a linear combination of mixed mont pair integrals. They are not exactly the same as before. There is some Ritchie curvature of omega involved as well. But all of these terms are very uh, innocent, uh, completely manageable, again, in the setting of pluripotential theory. <clears throat> and uh, so to show that these two functionals play a fundamental role in complex geometry in general, uh, I recall that, oops, this is not what I wanted to do, sorry. Uh, okay, we have an asymptotic expansion of, so if we start with, with the, the L2 norm induced by phi, so phi induces a positively curved metric on the line bundle L and therefore L2 norms on sections of ML for all powers M. And then if you compute the volume of this norm, meaning the volume of the unit ball that you scale correctly, you get an asymptotic expansion whose first two terms are expressed by the two functionals we saw. So E of phi, and then the, the subdominant term is given by M of phi. And it's, this is just a version of the Bergman kernel asymptotics that you integrate uh, at the level of functionals. Now we talk about coercivity, which is the condition that will dictate the existence of a CSCK metric. Uh, so to phrase this, we introduce yet another functional, which is, should be understood as just a, a simple variant of the E functional, the mont pair energy. But this, uh, the, the J functional of Aubin is just the J of phi, is defined by taking the mean value of phi with respect to the reference volume form omega to the n, and then minus E of phi. So the first term should be seen as a very <coughs> simple term that is just here to normalize the mont pair energy. And when you do this, you get something which is first of all non-negative, and, and secondly, can be seen as a, a higher dimensional version of the Dirichlet functional from classical pluripotential theory. Uh, the Dirichlet functional, the Dirichlet norm of a subharmonic function is the, the L2 norm of the, the gradient of phi. So that would be the integral of d phi wedge dc phi. And here we get a similar expression for j of phi as a positive linear combination of integrals involving d, d phi wedge dc phi, but then also these partial mont pair things, so omega phi to the j times omega to the n minus one minus j. Okay, and so we think of j of phi as a sort of norm on H. Uh, so if you come back to the <coughs> k energy m, the Mabuchi functional m, its pluripotential part is controlled by this Dirichlet norm, by the j functional, 
in a linear way, we have a bound like this, MPP of phi can be bounded in absolute value by a linear function of J of phi. And uh, the entropy part also somehow uh, is controlled, but this time only from below by the, the J functional. You have a linear bound from below. So the entropy grows at least as fast as J of phi, and in fact, strictly faster. It's, it's, much, it's a much stronger condition to bound the entropy than to bound the, the energy. So entropy controls the energy. And now uh, we can state this very important result by Xuxiong Chen and Zhengyu uh, Chen from early 2018, I think, the preprint on the archive, uh, which completely takes care of the analytic part of the YTD conjecture. The meaning that they show the, that the existence of a CSCK metric, which is a both order PDE, quite difficult and so on, can in fact, uh, is proved to be equivalent to the coercivity of the K energy, which is a linear growth condition with respect to the J functional. Okay, so it's a long story and this thing was initially proved in the setting of Keller-Einstein metric, this equivalence uh, by the work of Tian in the 90s, in the early 90s. <clears throat> and what's hidden behind it is a variational perspective on the CSCK problem because you are looking for a critical point of M. A CSCK metric is the same thing as a critical point of M. And so what's hidden behind this result, at least philosophically speaking, is the, the convexity of M, which is true in some sense that we will come back to in, in a few minutes. And so M being uh, convex will admit a minimizer exactly when it grows at least linearly, which if you take a naive picture of a convex function, a strictly convex function of one real variable is true. But of course, here it's a very deep result. And you see that it, it's a kind of competition between the two bounds we had before. So the, the pluripotential part of M is always controlled in a linear way by J of phi. And the entropy part is always at least as large as a linear function of J of phi. And then it's about the balance between the two. The entropy has to win uh, in such a way that the sum H of phi plus MPP of phi is at least uh, growing linearly with respect to J. Okay, so that we take, of course, as a black box. I won't say anything about this result. And rather, I want to now to turn to the non-Archimedean analog of what I, we just discussed that will lead us to the case stability condition. And then the YTD conjecture is about comparing case stability and the existence of a CSCK metric. <clears throat> so we try to go non-Archimedean by mimicking some of the things we said before. So first of all, the, the space we will work with is an identification of X, just as we've been previously working without even thinking about it on the, the complex analytic space attached to X. X was initially a smooth projective variety, algebraic variety over C, and C has its absolute, usual absolute value, the, the modulus, with respect to which you get the usual analytification. Now, if you replace the, the, the modulus, the usual absolute value on C by the trivial absolute value, which is the one that is always equal to one, except on the zero function, then there is a notion of analytic, analytification with respect to this non-Archimedean absolute value. And it turns out in this setting to be just um, a space of valuations that you compactify in a, in a good way. So XNA, NA stands for non-Archimedean, is a compact Hausdorff space that contains as a dense subset the space of usual valuations, real valued, valuations on the function field of X. And these we think of as vanishing orders of some kind, some generalized vanishing orders. So for example, if you have a divisor in X, the vanishing order along the divisor is a valuation. And we are basically dealing with things like that, which are called divisorial valuations. Uh, at least if you allow the divisor to 
to live on a birational model of X, and then limits of these. You can show that divisorial valuations are dense in the Berkovich space. <clears throat> so anyway, there, there, there is this space of valuations, and to get the compactification, it's a space of semi-valuations, meaning valuations also on sub-varieties of X. And on this space, you can mimic a good portion of pluripotential theory. So first of all, the first point is that if you take a section of some power of or line bundle, or in fact, of any line bundle, uh, this section can be evaluated on evaluation. There is a notion of vanishing order of a section with respect to any evaluation. It can be defined by trivializing the line bundle at uh, the center of the evaluation. That's, that's V of S, it's a real number, <clears throat> which is in fact non-negative. And then you can attach to, to, to this a function absolute value of S uh, by taking, passing to the exponential. So if you take the exponential of minus evaluation, you get something which is called a multiplicative semi-norm. And here the idea is that the line bundle L comes with a canonical metric, which is the trivial metric, so that you can measure the norm of any section. It's a special feature of non-Archimedean geometry. Um, so now, out of sections, you will produce basic functions, potentials, or metrics. If you want, it would be the same, in fact, in this setting. Um, so what you do is you, you take sections, SI, of some multiple of L, ML, and then you have the log of SI, which is just evaluated on evaluation V, is minus V of SI. Then you want to also allow translation by a constant and taking finite max. And you want the function that you get in this way to, to be continuous and in particular uh, bounded. So you want the, the sections in question to have no common zeros. And then you have a function phi like this, which should be really thought of as the non-Archimedean version of the usual Fubinich 2D metric in complex geometry, where you would have the sum, I'm sorry, you, you would have the log of the sum of squares of SI, and here you have this, the log of the max of SI, basically. Uh, and these functions, so they are called Fubinich 2D potentials in this, situ in this setting. And they, are the, they are the building blocks of pluripotential theory. Uh, so the role they play with respect to case stability is that, uh, so we proved in, in previous work with uh, Hisamoto and, and, and Yonsan, that the space H and A of functions of this type, Fubinich 2D potentials, is in fact in one-to-one one, one -one correspondence with the set of test configurations for XL. So first of all, test configurations, so I won't write down the full definition, but they are just, it's just a gadget that encodes uh, a C-star equivalent degeneration of X. So what you do is that you use sections of L to embed X in some projective space, and then you, you pick some simple C-star action, linear C-star action on, on the projective space, and you degenerate X using the C-star action. And the, the family <clears throat> that you get in this way that lives over C is a test configuration, script X, and it has a line bundle a polarization, script L. So that's a test configuration. And the line bundle is ample, if you take the normalization, then you get a normal ample test configuration. And these gadgets are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the functions in the space H and A. Uh, okay, so now in this setting, we also have a notion of energy and entropy, as we had before in the complex case. So first of all, uh, you need mixed Mongeampere integrals, as we saw before, and they can be introduced in this situation for, fun, for, so for Fubinich 2D potentials. In fact, you can define these integrals as intersection numbers on test configurations. Or a different approach is that you can define uh, forms and currents and usual calculus from complex differential geometry in the non-Archimedean situation by work of Chamberlois and Ducrot. And if you specialize to our situation, you, re you can show that they can indeed be expressed as intersection numbers on test configurations. So the two approaches are equivalent. 
And uh, there is also a notion of entropy in this situation. So now it's, it's quite different. It looks quite different from the previous one because it has to do with the log discrepancy function. So th th there are several justifications for this because it looks very strange the first time you see it. So the, the, the entropy functional H of phi, the non-Archimedean one, is given by integrating the log discrepancy function AX from uh, birational geometry, from mini the minimal model program, with respect to the Mont-Jean-Pierre measure MA of phi. So once you have mixed Mont-Jean-Pierre integrals, you have mixed Mont-Jean-Pierre measure. The Mont-Jean-Pierre of phi for a function phi in, uh, for a Fubinich 2D potential is just a finite sum of Dirac masses, in fact, in this situation. So you are taking just a finite average of AX. Uh, okay, so one, uh, I'm sorry, I'm jump, jumping ahead a bit. Uh, so once you have this, once you have these two ingredients, you can introduce the non archimedean version of the mont energy E of phi and of the K energy M of phi, just as before. You have the entropy, you have the mixed mont integrals. integral. So you just use the same formula that we had before in the complex case and you get non archimedean versions of the functional or the functionals. Okay, so one justification to see that this is indeed the correct form formal, uh, formalism is that in this situation, you replace the, the L2 norm by the soup norm induced by Fubinich to the potential or metric on the line bundle L. So you get a soup norm with respect to M phi for sections of ML. There is a natural notion of volume also in this situation, which is basically the volume of the unit ball again. And then again, we have an asymptotic expansion of the volume functional with the two first terms, uh, coefficients are expressed by the E functional and the M functional, just as before. So this, com this comes this time from a riemann rohr expansion on the test configuration uh, instead of uh, bergman kernel asymptotics. Okay, so now case stability can be expressed in this formalism as follows. So you pick a Fubinich pot a potential phi. It's a function on the Berkovich space, on the space of valuations that uh, corresponds to a test configuration for XL. Uh, so the relation to K-stability and GIT stability comes first of all from the fact that the mont energy, the non-Archimedean one, ENA of phi, is uh, when it coincides with the appropriate normalization with the true weight of XL from geometric invariant theory. So I'm not going to describe what the true weight is, but if you heard the story before, then this is exactly the same thing. ENA encodes the, the true weight. And on the other hand, uh, the M of phi, MNA of phi, the non Archimedean K energy, encodes basically the donaldson futaki invariant of the test configuration. So that's an invariant that, was, that generali generalizes the, the classical Futaki invariant introduced by Donaldson in this algebraic context. And uh, that governs case stability. Case stability means that the donaldson Futaki invariant of any test configuration should be positive. So the precise relation is that the donaldson Futaki invariant is equal to MNA of phi up to some error term that has to do with the possibly non-reduced uh, central fiber of the test configuration. But now you can always perform finite base change to turn the central fiber into a reduced subscheme, and then you get rid of this term. So that's a very unimportant error term somehow that you can absorb. So they are essentially the same. The Nelson Futek invariant is equal to MNA of phi. And using this, you can basically reformulate case stability in one version of it, one of its uh, formulations as follows. Uh, so a polarized variety XL will be uniformly case stable if the K energy functional, the non-Archimedean one, is coercive on the non-Archimedean version of script H. And here it means just MNA greater than some positive multiple of J and A, where J and A is defined by basically the same formula as before. 
except that the, that the, the mean value of phi happens to be equal to the sup of phi in this situation, the mean value with respect, in fact, to a Dirac mass at a certain point. Anyway, it's not so important. So we have a version of JNA, which is non-negative. It plays the role, again, of a norm on HNA. And here, coercivity, the, the coercivity condition does not involve an additive constant because there is a certain scaling action of the positive real numbers on the whole picture that kills any additive constant sort of automatically. But so you see that uh, CSCK, the existence of a CSCK metric was equivalent before by Chen and Cheng to uh, the coercivity of M on script H. And here, uniform case stability is equivalent to the coercivity of M and A on H and A. And now, uh, the Yao Chen Donaldson conjecture, uh, so one possible, possible formulation is that XL is uniformly case stable if and only if uh, it admits a CSCK metric. Uh, and so it means that you want to relate coercivity of M with uh, coercivity of M and A. You want the two things to be equivalent by the Chen and Cheng result. So I should, I should comment here that this is precisely where the, the assumption on, on the automorphism group uh, shows up because um, in fact, uniform case stability implies that the automorphism group of XL is trivial. So this is the formulation of YTD under the assumption of a trivial automorphism group. Otherwise you have, otherwise you have to involve the automorphism group in some way. I mean, there is, a, there, there is a version, slightly more complicated looking version of it in the general case as well. Okay, um, so what's next? So in order to relate coercivity on H in H and in H and A, you will pass to a larger space of finite energy potentials, finite energy metrics, if you want, which is the space E1 that was initially originally introduced in work of uh, Gage and Zaria E on the complex Mongeampere equation. Uh, so to do this, you, you introduce singular scalar potentials, which are omega PSH functions. So for the moment, we are in the complex analytic case. So X is the complex analytic variety. And you define the space PSH of omega PSH functions on, a, on X as the space of functions that can be written as, oops, uh, no, it's okay, in fact, okay. So as the space of functions that can be written as decreasing limits of functions of Keller potentials. So this is a regularization theorem if you want, if you take the, the usual definition of omega PSH functions, then it follows from work of De May, for example, that uh, in fact, phi can be written as a decreasing limit of a sequence in script H, so that you can view the set of PSH of all such omega PSH functions as a kind of monotonic completion of script H. And then, uh, and then the, the Mongeampere energy E can be extended to PSH functions in a simple way just because it's, it's a monotone increasing functional. So recall that the derivative of the Mongeampere energy E is given by the Mongeampere measure MA of phi, which is a non-negative measure. And so non-negativity of the, of the derivative implies that E of phi is non-decreasing, and therefore you will have limits along decreasing sequences like this, phi i. So you can define the limit E of phi for any PSH function, except that it might be infinite. And you say that phi has finite energy if, if E of phi is finite. And you get in this way the space E1. You get the space E1. Uh, of omega PSH functions of finite energy. And this space has a natural topology. So in fact, it has two topologies. So the, there is one which is the weak topology induced by the usual topology of PSH functions, which is the, the L1 topology. And it has a strong topology where you refine the previous one to make the functional E continuous. And in fact, it, uh, it turns out that then you get sort of norm topology, which is analogous to the, the one you would get from the Dirichlet functional in potential theory in one variable, which is 
kind of Sobolev space topology. And uh, so here we have important work of Darvash, who proved that this space E1 with a strong topology is in fact metrizable by a, a very natural metric D1, sort of Finsler metric. And it's complete with respect to this metric. So it, you can understand E1 as a completion of script H of the space of Keller potentials with respect to a canonically defined metric D1. That has good properties. For, for example, it's a geodesic space. Any two points can be joined by a, a geodesic segment, which is unique if you impose an extra condition that we will come back to in, in a minute. Uh, so why this space is so important in pluripotential theory is the, because of the following result. That, so it might be known to some of you that uh, extending the Mont Jean operator to PSH functions is a tricky business. So fundamental work of Bedford and Taylor in the late 70s showed that you can indeed define the Mont Jean operator on conti continuous PSH functions, just like you can extend the real Mont Jean operator in the, in the more classical setting of convex analysis to any convex functions because convex functions are automatically continuous. The PSH functions can be much more singular. So for continuous ones or bounded ones, in fact, you can define a mont -Jean pair operator. And so you can make sense of integrals of the form uh, omega phi 1, wedge, et cetera, wedge omega phi n. That's the mixed mont -Jean pair measure that you integrate against uh, another function phi naught. And what happens here is that you can, in fact, make sense of this formalism for more singular functions, which are functions in this space E1 of finite energy. And what you get is furthermore continuous with respect to the strong topology. And that's something which is very desirable. So in the usual pluripotential setting, the continuity properties of mont operators are a bit tricky. You only, only get continuity along monotonic sequences. And here with the, this correct topology, you get in fact continuity in the, in the natural way. So you get a good continuous extension of the mixed mont pair operator and mixed mont pair integrals to the whole space E1. And uh, what happens now is that <clears throat> in the non-Archimedean uh, setting, so you can you replace the space X with XNA, the non-Archimedean version of it. And in work with, uh, joint work with uh, Matthias Janssen based on previous work with uh, Charles Fab as well. We showed that uh, you can similarly define a continuous extension of mixed mont pair integrals to the full space E1NA, so the non-Archimedean version of E1, which is again defined. It's exactly the same definition. So PSH NA it is defined by decreasing limits of functions in script H. So except that here there is no a priori definition of PSH, this is the definition in this situation. And inside of this space, you detect functions that have finite energy with respect to ENA, and it comes with a strong topology and you have continuous extension of mixed mont integrals as well. Uh, okay. So that's the first step to relate uh, coercivity of M on the space script H to its non-Archimedean counterpart, which corresponds to case stability. So the next important step is uh, the concept of geodesic stability. You introduce geodesics in the space of Keller potentials, or rather in its completion, which is the space E1, because this is where they will live in general. They will not be regular enough to remain in the space script H. Uh, okay, so the first thing is that the K energy, M of phi that we saw before, so it has these two parts, H of phi, the entropy, and MPP of phi, which uh, is described in terms of mixed mont integrals. And because of that, you can make sense of M of phi for any finite energy function, phi. So you define H of phi as the, the, the entropy of the mont of phi that the entropy makes sense for any probability measure, in fact, except that it can be infinite, it's, it's a positive or infinite real number. 
Uh, and MPP of phi is again a linear combination of fixed Montgomery integrals. So this one is finite. Now, in the space E1, there is a distinguished class of geodesics for the metric D1, which, is, uh, which are called PSH geodesics because they, they correspond to a plurisub harmonicity condition uh, that you can phrase by. Uh, in the following way, so you take phi t of x, it's a, it's a geodesic parameterized by a non-negative real number t, and you view it as a function on, on x times the punctured disk with the variable z. Uh, by uh, introducing this change of variable, you look at phi at the time minus log z evaluated at the, the point x. And this function is omega psh, in the two variables at the same time when the geodesic is PSH by definition. Okay. And if you impose this place of harmonicity, then you get uniqueness. For example, there is notion of PSH uh, path as well. And there is a unique PSH geodesic segment joining any two points in E1. So uniqueness is granted by the place of harmonicity condition. And geodesic rays as well uh, can be singled out uh, using this PSH uh, condition. Okay, and now um, we have the next result, which explains somehow that in order to test coercivity of the functional M on the space script H, so first of all, the coercivity of M on the space script H is equivalent to coercivity on the space E1. And then you have the, one of the following two cases uh, happens. So either M is indeed coercive on script H or equivalently on the space E1, or it will fail to grow along one of these special geodesic rays. So uh, along a PSH geodesic ray in E1, and it will be bounded above along this ray. So either you grow along any single ray in individual. Yeah, I'm sorry. What it means is that if you grow along any uh, geodesic ray individually, then you, you grow in a uniform way on the whole space E1, which is the coercivity condition. So this is, this is proved by contradiction. If, if coercivity fails, then you look at longer and longer segments along which the coercivity condition fails. And using a compactness result, you extract in the limit a ray in E1 along which, along which M of phi t doesn't grow. And this is, so this condition, so if M of phi t grows along any geodesic ray, then you, you say that you, geodesic stability is realized. So now you have a reformulation of the Chen and Cheng result, which is that a CSCK metric exists if and only if geodesic stability is satisfied. And the next step is that you want to turn to relate geodesic stability to K stability. So you want to relate geodesic rays to test configurations and the completion of that, which is the space E1 and A. Uh, and this part of the story takes place in the space of rays, of geodesic rays. Okay, so the first point is that if you take two PSH uh, geodesic rays, in fact, any two geodesic, uh, I'm sorry, any two PSH geodesic uh, path in the space E1, uh, and you measure the distance between phi t and phi prime t at time t, then this is a convex function of t. That's a very important property. So it says that two rays have to diverge somehow unless they, are, they remain parallel with each other, in which case, if you impose that the origin is the same, they would be equal. This convexity property is something that you see in the set, setting of CAT0 geometry, so this metric version of uh, non-negative curvature, uh, non-positive curvature. So here, the space E1 is not CAT0, but if you restrict it's not cat zero, and in fact, you don't have uniqueness of geodesic segments between two points. 
but you have uniqueness if you impose the PSH condition. And again, if you impose the PSH condition, you, you in fact have the convexity property of the metric, which is a stronger statement than uniqueness of geodesic segments. So from this convexity property, you can introduce a natural uh, distance metric on the space of rays. So you, you look at geodesic rays, which are PSH in the space E1, and all of them you require uh, that the origin is uh, zero, the, the special omega PSH function that we have singled out. And so you only take rays that start at the origin. And by the convexity, you can look at the slope of the distance between phi t and phi prime t. And this slope, so the limit of one over t times d1 of phi t phi prime t will exist. And this is something that you view as the distance between the two rays capital phi and capital phi prime. So it's the distance d1 hat. And it was proved by Darvash and uh, Chin Lu that this uh, endows the space e1 hat of all PSH geodesic rays in e1 with a complete metric uh, structure, complete metric space structure. And it's also, in fact, a geodesic space. You can you have a notion of geodesic in the space of rays. And uh, by the previous result that we saw, the, the one that says that k stability, uh, I'm sorry, the one that says that, that coercivity of m is to be tested along rays, uh, what we get is that coercivity along m is equivalent to the coercivity, in fact, of m hat, the function induced by m on the space of rays by taking the slope at infinity along rays with respect to the metric d1 hat. So what I'm saying is that uh, the functional m is coercive if and only if the, the slope version of m, m hat, so the limit of 1 over t, m of phi t, is greater than the positive multiple of d1 hat on the space e1 hat. And now it's this space E1 hat, the space of rays that is closely related to the space of non-Archimedean uh, finite energy functions. But this comes from work with uh, Berman and Jonsson that we, in which we explored this relation. So in one direction, if you start from a PSH geodesic ray, uh, you can attach to it a, a function in the space E1, the non-Archimedean space, I'm sorry, the space uh, of non-Archimedean uh, finite energy functions, so the space E1 and A. So you start from a PSH geodesic ray capital phi, and as before, you view it as a function on the product of X with the punctured disk, and this function is basically PSH, pretty subharmonic. So you can uh, measure its singularities using lunar numbers, which are a version of vanishing orders for purely subharmonic functions. If you view a PSH function as a generalization of a log of a holomorphic function, then the little number is a generalization of the vanishing order of the holomorphic function. And using that, you get a function on the space of valuations that you can extend, in fact, to the space of semi-valuations. So the technology behind this is uh, multiplier ideals. And then you show that you get indeed a function phi and a in the space E1 and a from any PSH geodesic ray. And conversely, what we proved in this paper with Berman and Jonsson is that if you start from any function in E1 and a, then there is a canonical way to attach to it a PSH geodesic ray. Uh, if you require, so there are many rays capital phi that will have uh, the same function that will give rise to the same function phi and a because you only capture in some sense the algebraic part of the singularities of phi by taking little numbers so you throw away a good part of the singularities of capital phi but if but there is a maximal one that has this property and then this one is unique so there is a maximal psh geodesic ray capital phi uh, that corresponds to a given uh, finite energy 
function on the Berkovich space. And so what you get from this picture is that you have the bigger space E1 hat of all PSH geodesic rays. And inside of it, you get an embedding of the, the space of non-Archimedean finite energy potentials onto the space of maximal rays. So there is a big space of all rays and a smaller space of maximal ones that have to do with algebraic geometry. And there is also a projection or a retraction from the bigger space to the smaller space, which is the operation we just saw that if you start with any ray, you get a function in E1 and A that you can view as a maximal ray. So there is a natural operation that takes any ray and attaches to it a maximal ray. Okay, and now we are basically done. So I guess I, guess I went a bit too fast, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> so the thing I wanted to uh, advertise in this talk is in fact recent progress by Chile a few months ago. So Chile uh, proved that, uh, proved the version of YTD in this general situation. So we saw before that uh, the YTD conjecture, if you take as a formulation that a uniform K stability should be equivalent to the existence of a CSCK metric, then this version of YTD amounts to proving that coercivity of the K energy on the space of Keller, potential, Keller potentials script H is equivalent to coercivity on the non-Archimedean version HNA which is the space of test configurations. And what Chile proved is that uh, the K energy, uh, the coercivity of the K energy on the space E1 is in fact equivalent to the coercivity of MNA on the space uh, of non-Archimedean finite energy potentials. So that, that's definitely, it, it could have been one formulation of YTD, so you, you can definitely assert that Chile proved a version of YTD in that paper. Then, uh, of course, you, 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 could, you, you would want to reduce the space of test objects and go back to the, say, the more traditional formulation of the YTD conjecture. So on, on the left-hand side of the story, uh, coercivity of M on the bigger space E1 is in fact already known to be equivalent to coercivity on the smaller space script H. This was already proved in, in a paper by Berman, Darvash, and Lou. So that, on that part of the story, it's equivalent to work on H or to work on E1. And on the right-hand side, on the other hand, it, it's not known at this point that you can really reduce activity of, on the bigger space E1 and A to coercivity on the smaller one. So it's, it's a regularization result that is missing in this situation. So we have a precise conjecture with uh, Matthias Janssen that should do the job, but we don't know how to prove it. So that's somehow the remaining bit to get the full YTD. And it's a purely algebra geometric question. Uh, but Chile but is already able to reduce the space, uh, the cursivity on the right-hand side to a smaller space, which is, uh, where you, you, you don't work with test configurations, but you work with a, a generalization of that, which are uh, filtrations on the space of sections. So it's been understood for quite a while that uh, test configurations can be viewed as filtrations on the space of sections, but they are finitely generated filtrations in some sense. And if you re remove the finite generation condition, then you get uniform case stability with respect to filtrations. And it follows from my work with uh, Jonsson that coercivity on filtrations or on E1 and A is in fact equivalent. So you get as a, as a consequence that case stability with respect to filtrations is really the same as the existence of a CSCK metric. Okay, and so just to conclude, let me give you a few ideas of what's into this recent progress by Chile. Uh, okay, so the key points are uh, 
first of all, okay, there is a typo here. So, um, so you, you start with a geodesic ray, capital phi, which is PSH as before, and you assume that the ray is maximal. Then you get the following two pieces of information. So on the one hand, the, the slope of the J functional, the energy, is equal, not just greater or then or equal to, but really equal to J and A of phi and A. And that, that's, in fact, this inequality uh, here, uh, so the in inequality, of course, is, is true, but it's true for any PSH ray, and equality is a characterization of maximal rays, in fact. So the slope is really computed by the non-Archimedean or algebra geometric counterpart of the ray. And on, on the other hand, it's much more difficult to handle the K energy M because of the entropy uh, part in it. So the, the, the pluripotential part of M satisfies the same thing as J. So the, for the pluripotential part of M, the slope is computed purely by the non-Archimedean metric function phi and A. But then the, the tricky part is the entropy. And at for the entropy, you can prove that at least you have this slope inequality. So the slope of, of the entropy part and therefore of the, whole, the full K energy functional M is at least equal to what is dictated by the algebra geometric picture. So what's into this is that if you, if you don't take just a maximal ray, but even a ray uh, that comes from algebraic geometry, a ray attached to a test configuration, so the, it's the case where the function phi and a is in the space script h and a of uh, test configurations. Then you have equality for the slope of m. It's something we proved before with uh, Hisamoto and Yonsan. And then you can, from that, you can go up to the more general case of maximal rays. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the key observation by Chelli is the following. So the key observation is that if you take any PSH geodesic ray and you assume that the K energy M is bounded above on the ray, so this is what you get in this argument by contradiction. If you assume that you don't have coercivity by the results with Berman and so on that was stated before, then you get such a ray. And you need to conclude, you need to reach a contradiction from the coercivity assumption on E1 and A. So you have this ray, and it's, this ray a priori has no reason to be maximal, right? It's just a ray that you get by a compactness argument along which M is bounded above. But now remember that uh, in M of, phi, M of phi t, you have the entropy part H of phi t, and you have the energy part or the pluripotential part of M, which is controlled in a linear way by the energy. So along a ray phi t, which is a geodesic ray like that, the energy is basically equal to, to T. So it says that the pluripotential part of M of phi T is big O of T. And so what you see is that uh, if you pick one of these rays along which M is not growing, then the entropy part can grow at most linearly with respect to T. And that's a very strong condition on the ray. And so the, the key point that's truly proved is that if this linear growth condition holds for the entropy, then in fact the ray has to be maximal automatically. So this means that somehow the, all the singularities of the ray are encoded in the little numbers. There is no room for some extra transcendental part of the singularities because that, that would yield a more than linear, a super linear growth for the entropy. Okay, and, and then once you, if you combine the two things, then you're good. So you assume that M and A is coercive on E1 and A, and you want to show that M is coercive on E1. So if it's not coercive, you get a PCH ray along which M is bounded by the observation, the key observation, the ray is maximal, and then you have control on the slopes of J and M as above, but with an equality sign for the J part. And, uh, and then, you had that M and A is greater than the positive multiple of J and A, but on the other hand, uh, M 
of it is, is bounded above, so the, the slope of that is negative, and this is a contradiction. And I guess I'm done. Yes, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. And now it's time for uh, remarks and questions. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mm, any questions? I, I was wondering to what extent this relies on X being projective. And the CSCK problem makes sense for non-projective manifolds. Is it really essential or is it just presentation that, that a lot of this is uh, in the projective setting? I agree. Um, I guess, no, I guess it's not fundamentally essential, I think. It's a matter of having the, the correct uh, formalism on the, for the non archimedean part. So somehow it's convenient to, first of all, to rely on the Berkovich space formulation because it, it's already there. But you can mimic the construction and devise a space, even in the Keller situation, that would play the same role. I mean, we know what, what it means to take the vanishing order along a component of the central fiber of a test configuration in the Keller case as well, of course. And then you need to complete that in some way, and that's something which is at least possible to do. Yeah. So I think the, the non archimedean part, you can make sense of that in the Keller situation as well. Uh, yeah, I, I guess one, one thing that could be tricky is, uh, I guess, in, in the correspondence between rays and functions in E1, E1 and A, I mentioned that we use in an essential way at some point multiple ideals and vanishing theorems attached to them. So in the Keller case, we do have multiple ideals, but of course there, there is no vanishing theorem because there is no cohomology, there is no line bundle any, anymore. And so here there is something that should be done. I guess it's it's probably possible to do something, but there is a difficulty here that goes beyond just formalism. Mm -hmm. And then I suppose that once you have that, it should be more or less transparent than you, you could go Keller. It would be more or less the same, I okay. think. Thanks. Welcome. Uh, I have a second question then, if uh, <laughs> sure. no one else fancies. Uh, so this notion that Chile has of, um, in his paper, he was calling it uniform case stability with respect to models, which is essentially what you were talking about. Yeah. Um, is this practical in the same way that uniform case stability kind of is? I mean, for example, can you show that Calabi is are uniformly in case stable in, in this sense? Uh, sure. No. So, so I think, uh, Yes, yes, yes. I think in this situation, yeah, for Calabiao, I, I think it's fine, yeah. Okay. I mean, so the, it, it's really about, so yeah, you, the point is to pass from case stability with respect to test configurations to what he calls case stability with respect to models, which I think, so I think in this, in this formalism, models means uh, a test configuration when you don't insist that you have ampleness and then to recover some positivity, you, you take a kind of PSH envelope in this non archimedean framework. And then you, you recover positivity in some sense, but, it's a, but what you get is a limit. It's more like a filtration. It's not mm -hmm. a test configuration anymore. But anyway, uh, then you want to approximate. If you start, from, for example, from a filtration, you know very well how, how to approximate it even in a canonical way by test configurations. But the, but the, the key, question is, do you have convergence of the entropy parts? So the, the, the mean value of the, the discrepancy in this procedure. And that's exactly the, the point that remains to do. Mm -hmm. So once, and so we believe that this is true, and once you have this, then, it's, then it means that uniform case stability with respect to the, the bigger space 
So either filtrations or, or even the full space E1 and A would be just as practical as the usual one. So, which means not, not that practical as you know, but, <laughs> but um, nothing worse. But in the Calabria case, it's fine because uh, only the entropy part survives in the, the expression for the donaldson futek invariance. And then we already know that this, this is greater than a positive multiple of J and A. Mm. Even in the big space I see. of singular guys. Oh, thanks. Mm, other questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, then that's the end of the talk. Thank you very much. Welcome.